Hey everyone, Michael Lover here with another edition of Ask an Astronomer. And as always, just a couple doors down from me on unceded territory of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh is our astronomer, Marley. Hey Marley, how's it going? It's good. How are you? Oh, I'm excited for this episode. Uh, it all came to me last week when I was listening to my favorite podcast of all time. It was like the first time I ever like listened to podcasts back in like 2012. Hmm. Um, Radio Lab has always been uh, the goat for me. But uh, they've got a new host, Lots of Nasser, and he told this story, and it was just such a great setup. So I'm really excited to get uh, talking about quasi moons and Zuzve. Uh, if you're out there and you're like, "What am I? What are these words coming out of my mouth?" That we all will be explained. If you're out there watching on YouTube, on Facebook, even on Instagram, if you are watching on Instagram and you want to see the full video, you'll have to switch on over to YouTube because the just because the cropping on. Instagram is a little bit strange, but you can also hear us. Uh, go to YouTube and you'll get the full visuals that Marley is going to show. And if you have any questions, throw them in there. If they're about quasi-moons or anything else under the universe, we'll answer them before we get to the half hour mark today. Marley, we are talking about this very strange thing that it was not a real thing. In fact, I'm not even real sure that <laughs> any of the things that we're going to talk about today are real. Uh, quasi moons, um, very very strange. So let let me set, set this up here uh, based on what Lot of Nasser talked about in the podcast Radio Lab. So he's got one of these posters in his uh, toddler's room, and he's just you know one of these artist renderings. You probably maybe you ha uh, out there have one at home. And he goes in and he's half half asleep and he's looking at this poster. And he sees that there is this, what looks like a moon, orbiting around Venus. And if you look at it here on the picture, it looks like it says Zuzve. And he's like, I didn't think that Venus had a moon. That's like one of the, that's like Astro 101. It's like Mercury doesn't have a moon. Venus doesn't have a moon. <laughs> Earth has one. Mars has two. Jupiter has got a million, right? Yeah. And so then he's like, calls up his like NASA friends. He's like, does Venus have a moon? Like, no. No. Uh, so he kind of like asked a few more people and they kind of forgets about it. But then his NASA friend calls him back and he's like, wait a minute. I was looking at this uh, again and I think it might actually be 2002 VE, which it does kind of look like when you look at it and you're like, hey, like, and then he calls up the artist and the artist is like, hey, like, where did you get this? And he's like, oh, I found it on like a list. And then, but I think in my notes uh, that I wrote down is 2002 I thought it said Zuzve, so he just put it on there. And that started this whole mystery of like what this thing is. So Marley, first off, tell us what 2002 VE even is. What even is, so it's it's an object. It does exist. So at the top, <laughs> you're like, well, I don't know if any of this actually exists. No, this object exists. It's just one of those things in astronomy where uh, we as human beings love to categorize and space doesn't care about what we try to put it into boxes. And so to understand what uh, this object is, you have to understand what are true satellites and what are quasi satellites. So true satellites would be something like our moon, right? Our moon is a natural satellite. It orbits Earth and it orbits in a stable orbit, right? It's always there. It's consistent. You know, these are what we typically think of moons or satellites. We're thinking of true moons or true satellites. Quasi-satellites, they actually orbit the sun, but they look like they're orbiting the planet from the frame of reference of the planet. So if you right. are standing on Venus, it looks like Zuzve is orbiting Venus. In one year, it orbits <laughs> Venus, right? But it's not. It's actually orbiting the sun. And these orbits are actually, on the in the grand scheme of, of space and how we measure time and space, are unstable orbits. So they do move around and they do change, right? And they're kind of Quasi-satellites are part of this broader umbrella of co-orbital objects. So things right. that are in the same orbit as other things, which we'll get into in a second. So when we think about orbits, I have to make a diagram because that's the only way I can understand <laughs> how orbits are doing. Um, this is why my hair looks the way it does because I was trying to understand all of this uh, this afternoon. I mean, and the so hair looks was... great, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. But it was a lot of... Um... A lot of drawings, me drawing things out and being like, how am I going to? Anyway, so when we think of, you know, 
the earth, moon, sun, right? We have our sun, earth, you know, or whatever planet is moving around the sun. And then the moon is orbiting that planet, right? right. It's very much just a compact, simple, much more easier to understand. When we think about quasi moons and co-orbital objects, we have to think about what we call orbital resonance. So what orbital resonance is, is when orbiting bodies, you know, as they're moving around, they're exerting like gravitational influence on each other uh, mm -hmm. at like a constant and like a, a periodic fashion, right? So like they're always pulling, always tugging on each other. And usually it's because those orbital periods are related by a ratio or a small ratio, one to two or two, one to four. And it's usually found between a pairs of objects. So two objects together will have some sort of orbital resonance on each other. And that orbital resonance, you know, that can enhance the mutual gravitational influence, whatever that influence is. Mm -hmm. That can be the ability to like alter the orbit by a huge amount or hinder the orbit by a huge amount, right? It just exerts some sort of influence. And usually they're unstable, right? This is actually this type of phenomenon in orbital resonance is what we use when we define planets, right? So planets have to clear their orbit. And in doing so, that involves orbital resonance. They have an unstable orbital resonance with something smaller or similar size, and they fling it out of the solar system, right? That's mm -hmm. what that is. But sometimes I have to sh uh, change what I'm sharing. It happens to be stable. And when it's stable, we see them in a range of things, but most often or what will be most relevant um, to people will be Jupiter's moons. So right. um, Ganymede, Io, and, oh, I can't remember. Who's what, Europa. No, no, I think it's Europa. Or is it Callisto? One of the two. I think it's Europa, though. Whoa. Oh, that's the noise from the video. Okay, so when we have these orbital residences, we, and they're stable, we see them in the Galilean moons. As it's orbiting around, we see that they all orbit kind of at the same they line up every now and again. So Ganymede, uh, Io, and the other one, I don't remember right now. I think it's Europa. Yeah. Ganymede, Io, and Europa have a one to two to four residence, right? So if I play, oh boy, if I play it again, which it does not want to let me because I clicked the wrong thing, it will all, they'll all match up together, right? So as mm -hmm. Ganymede completes one orbit, uh, Io will complete four orbits and Europa will complete two orbits. So as they spin around, this video is from the European Space Agency. It's actually part of what JUICE is looking at, okay. investigating um, the orbital resonances of, of the moons and like how that influences the magnetic fields that they induced and already have in the case of Ganymede. So Io being the innermost one, it completes four orbits in the time it takes Ganymede to complete one, and Europa will complete two orbits in the time it takes Ganymede to complete one orbit. So this right. is an example of like stable orbital resonance, right? They're all together, but they all pull on each other, have kind of settled into this self-correcting system where they all have, you know, it's all timed out. They all follow each other. Now, mean motion orbital resonance, which is what the case of quasi-satellites have, that happens when two bodies have, just two of them, have a period of revolution that are close to each other. And that can be stabilizing or destabilizing to various degrees. And we can think of those like the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. They are in a mean motion orbital resonance, right? They're yeah. about the same distance. They're all moving together. Or it could be considered destabilizing, like actually in the rings of Saturn, we see this in what's called the Cassini division. That's been cleared out by a two to one ratio of resonance by um, Mimas. Actually, the moon Mimas has caused distortion in there. The Death Star moon. Yes. Yeah, the Death Star moon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we have all basically what it boils down to. Everything is moving and everything is pulling on each other and is having an effect on each other. And the one thing you have to consider is where you are watching this happen from, right? What are right. you seeing happen in the sky or what frame of reference are you in? Shout out to my grade nine math, uh, physics teacher who helped me figure that out. So what was, what was his name? I don't remember, but I remember his face. <laughs> I remember his face very clearly. Yeah. Um, Let's get him on the show. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so in the case of a quasi-satellite, we are looking here, what I've done is a view from the perspective from the sun, for example, right? So watching the things move around, you're kind of looking top down at the orbit. So the planet is orbiting the sun. That's that white 
you know, dotted line orbiting the sun, but the quasi satellite is also orbiting the sun. Mm -hmm. It's just that its path takes it around the planet, right? In terms of where it's moving. And so while it may look like a moon from, you know, first observation, it actually has a very different orbit than a moon would have. It's going around. The main controller of gravity is the sun, the same as what the planet is orbiting, as opposed mm -hmm. to only orbiting the planet. So a big difference with quasi-satellites is that they are too far away from the planet for the planet's gravity to have any kind of significant hold on them. They provide more of a, the planet provides more of like a stabilization factor, if mm -hmm. anything, or a very significant destabilization factor, depending on what's happening. Um, that's kind of the biggest difference. So in the case of Zuzve, uh, the quasi-satellite moves once around Venus in the same amount of time it takes Venus to go around the sun. They're traveling together. You can think of it like um, I heard it explained as like race cars on a track, right? They're both, one may be further out, like on the outer track and one mm -hmm. may be on the inner track. They're both going around the main central uh, location, but they're right by each other. So it looks like the outer track is orbiting the inner track. They're just moving along the same path, but yeah. one encompasses the other. I actually got a, a question just on this point here. 604 Flyfisher asks, are they on the same plane? Not necessarily. So they can be, but some of them are inclined relative to the plane of, of orbit of the planet. So there's like, it can range too. I think one of them is like nine degrees. I'm not sure what Zuzve's inclination is, um, but they don't necessarily have to be perfect alignment. They can be tilted, which okay. causes in some cases that um, retrograde appearing motion, right? That leapfrogging effect where it looks like it comes forward and then falls behind. Yeah. So these orbits can be very interesting to look at from the perspective of a planet so if you're on the planet this is my attempt at a free form orbit <laughs> on in powerpoint because uh, it doesn't do the right shape the planet will be you'll be moving around the sun as normal and it'll look like to you standing on the planet that this quasi satellite is your moon right it's moving around it's just very much further away than a moon should be right so these quasi satellites are very very different uh so if you were standing on venus this you would see this moving around. I, I assume it's probably not that big, so I don't know if you would actually like see it. If you could see it th through the clouds, which you can't. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uh, lot working against you here, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But in it, theory, it, yeah. if if you could, uh, you would see it orbit around almost like a normal moon would. Yeah, yeah. Its movement wow. would look, appears to be that of a normal moon, but it's not. It's it's moving around, orbiting the sun, same as Venus is. So okay. they're very interesting. They're, they're very interesting objects. They are real. They're just one of those things that kind of happen and astronomers go, oh, that's neat. And then they move on. They're, a big of it, a big part of it is, hey, is that going to hit us, right? Is mm. that going to, because they're typically asteroids or ch tiny asteroids or varying sizes. Zuzve is about just, just about 250 meters across. And so when it comes to detecting them, it's more so, oh, is this going to impact Earth in any way? And if not, it's kind of like, all right. And then, you know, you trace the orbit, you see it's not going to hit Earth, and then you kind of, you know, move on. It's not necessarily a big, interesting scientific. It's interesting, but not like necessarily a big, big part of it. Right. And the first time that I heard of quasi-moons was actually a reporter many years ago that caught on to this and wanted to know about Kruithni, which I was like, what the heck is Kruithni? <laughs> and then I had to kind of like do the same deep dive. But, but we were chatting just before, and you're saying Kruithni actually has changed status since then. Yeah, it's not a quasi moon. It's a co orbital object, which is just like, <laughs> yeah, like it does, it could, it could become one. Like the orbits can change. Uh, but currently, no, it's just a co orbital object, which means it's kind of in the vicinity of Earth and it also orbits the sun. Like it's, it's a very, yeah, it's just a problem of we really want things to have nice boxes. And there's so many things happening that don't fit into those nice boxes. Like our moon is also very weird, you know, like right. it's just our moon's way too big, you know, for like normal <laughs> other things. And so and it's really close. Right. And so there's all this because in doing this, I was looking up, you know, because Zuzve is quite far from, you know, from venus and okay. earth has quasi moons which we'll talk about in a second but i was like okay is there a specific distance where like you stop being a moon and i could not find an answer it was kind of like well it depends who you ask you know <laughs> depends who's written the paper whether or not it counts and i was like okay so it's one of those things where it's well the the orbit's weird but yeah. earth has these as well right earth has quasi moons um 
Neptune and Uranus have quasi moons. They actually, when the readings I read, which was not a ton, so don't like keep my word forever on it, Jupiter and Saturn like are too big and would have flung out their quasi moons already. Like the orbits would not have been stable enough to last very long. Um, and so any quasi moons they've had have been moved on to different orbits, which is very interesting. Yeah. But this is a video that's showing from JPL that's showing one of Earth's quasi moons, which is the asteroid 2016 HO3. It orbits the sun, but it appears to also be orbiting Earth if it'll if it'll play. Sometimes it really hates when I do this. So Earth is the blue one and the red is the orbit of the asteroid 2016 HO3 and the yellow line is like its orbit appearing from Earth, right? So when we're standing on Earth, we see as if it does this big looping orbit and this in this case it's not in the same point right it's it's perpendicular to the plane coming up up and down to reference that question and it kind of loops around earth uh -huh. uh, at, in its movement around the sun so this is a very interesting video because that red it's actually moving along this red line but from our perspective it looks <laughs> yeah. like it's moving around us right it is it is very very interesting to think about because it's movement and moving yourself from one reference frame to another and it, which is very difficult to do i i still struggle with it but it's interesting in the sense that it creates these you know movements that we wouldn't necessarily be like think about ever right when would we think about something orbiting the sun but also appearing to orbit earth yeah right? and i think it's really important to to note as it just popped up there on the screen like these are very tiny objects yes right? yes like they are very in comparison to our own moon uh, they are just pebbles they're, yeah, they're quite small. And then also to keep in mind is how far away these objects are as well. So with the case of 2016 HO, uh, the one three here orbiting Earth, Earth's gravity keeps it so that it never comes closer. So at its closest, it's still 38 times the distance of the moon from Earth. So these objects aren't necessarily like right next door to Earth or to Venus or to Jupiter. They're still quite a far distance away. Mm -hmm. um, and so tracking them in the event is very, is very easy when we find them, right? They're in that kind of sweet spot. If we can find them, we can figure out their orbits pretty quickly. Zuzve has one of the most studied orbits of, of the quasi-satellites. It was actually the first quasi-satellite ever discovered. And so, you know, they've looked at it quite a lot and it crosses Earth's orbit, but it's not necessarily one that we need to look out for. Right. right. Also, it's also, you know, pretty little um, in the case of 2016 HO3 at its farthest. It's 100 times the distance from between the Earth and the moon. So okay. very small, like in terms of our local neighborhood, in terms of our solar system neighborhood, it's it's pretty much the same distance from Earth is from the sun. So that's why it's in that same that same orbital lane kind of right it's mm -hmm. again one of those things where who draws the line i uh, got but, a question from uh abdul majid uh, sagur i think i said that right uh what would the moon be if it were further away than it actually is would it be its own planet and i guess what <laughs> right? where's, yeah. where's that line <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it, I guess, you know, it'll depend on how far it is. It also, because we, when we think about planets, we always think about them in, in any way from like when they start, right? So they're in this protoplanetary disk after the star has formed and they start to form over time. We don't really think of them as having been in one spot and then moved, even though that's that's what's happened. They've, they've moved and migrated uh, to their current locations and now they've just kind of stayed there for now kind of all harmonious together but if we were to just like move the moon and put it in some other orbit and it begins to orbit the sun yeah i don't know you know does that count because the big part of becoming a planet is that you've cleared your orbit so right. in the you know you've done this orbital resonance thing or use that as a mechanism to like shoot things out or you've absorbed them right in the case jupiter sometimes does just like gobbles things up and then other times it, it has it has just removed them from the solar system entirely so it's kind of a it never had an orbit if if it just went far away it never had an orbit to clear and so can it be a planet i don't know that's the <laughs> problem for the international astronomical union not for marley's but it's like it's a lot of boxes that don't necessarily work right it's it's fun it's fun but it is well, also and this gets back to the pluto debate right which is yeah. you know does it even matter what we call pluto it's still a very interesting world but you know, the argument for making the category is that categories matter because we need to study these things and then potentially 
give other worlds like minor planets, a lot of these other worlds kind of like more attention. As you saw, as soon as the IAU made the dwarf planet uh, category, all of a sudden Ceres and mm -hmm. Harwar and all these uh, worlds that were always there finally started to become relevant, you know, because now they were kind of like had an elevated status. So it's kind of weird because we as humans, we need these categories so that we can kind of understand. But at the end of the day, it's all kind of a mess because there is so yeah. many of these different weird objects that are very hard to categorize. It is. Yeah. Science is messy. And astronomy is just one of those things. Like when you're studying, you know, the entire universe is bound to have some problems, you know, when it comes to trying to make things work in a way and organize things in a way that we enjoy. Even, you know, it's just it's funny. I find it funny, but it is it is just one of those things that that happens a lot. It happens a lot. Same with like black hole classification, like the whole debate of whether or not they are can be intermediary mass black holes or like what's right. the limit? What's the upper limit? What's the largest small black hole you can have before it becomes an intermediate? You know, like who draws that line? I don't know. It really depends on who you ask. So well, because there is that whole talk of like the micro black holes yep. and, and that sort of thing. And and what is what is into that? Because if you're talking about micro black holes, all of a sudden people are freaking out because they're like, are micro black holes everywhere? Am I going to get sucked into a micro black hole? <laughs> if they're around, they haven't caused problems yet. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. You know, like, oh, yeah. Okay, so b back to Zuzve, because the whole reason that this story came about was because Lot of Nasser, the reporter, you know, got obsessed with this and then started this whole rabbit hole. And the theme of the episode, which I, I highly encourage people to go and listen to, there's actually an updated um uh, addendum to it, but don't listen to the update until you listen to the to the full episode. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll kind of spoil it at the end of this episode uh, of what happens at the end. But the theme of the episode is really how this order to our solar system and that classic children's poster up on the wall of eight planets and maybe a scattering of a few other things is far too simplistic for how solar systems actually are. And even in Latov and me myself, I was very interested in that gap between Mars and Jupiter and knowing everything that's going on in that gap with all of the asteroids. And now you, you know, we mentioned about the Trojan, you know, asteroids. Those are really, really interesting places, but they don't fit into this, like this neat, uh, nice, tidy little model of the solar system uh, that we see up there in the poster. And uh, it gave a lot of, a lot of comfort knowing that like, Hey, like the universe is, is uh is full of surprises and it will all constantly surprise you, which I think is a, is a wonderful theme to kind of like think about in something that even here at the space center when we're talking about space and um, opening up these little doors that sometimes fall into rabbit holes, it's it's fun and it, it gets people engaged and that's at the end of the day that's kind of what it's all about. Yeah, I mean whatever makes you curious, right? It's kind of like you, you know, space science is just it has chaos built in, right? Like no matter what <laughs> happens, there's something going on in the background that, you know, I guess if anyone's watching who's done like physics or is doing physics, it starts right away with the ignore air resistance, right? Like just just for the sake of simplicity, for the sake of this to work, just ignore air resistance, right? It starts from the beginning because there's so there's so many things happening at any time and it's never as clean and cut as you think it is it's always it's always pretty messy right um so uh, the end basically that the wrapping up of the story is that this object which was not called zeus it was called 2002 ve Latov took it upon himself to uh, reach out to the person that discovered this world because that's kind of like how it goes if you discover yes. a world you get to be the one to name it right yep and so he went Provided to him. Why did you follow some rules depending on which body you are in? Yeah. yeah. We won't get into those rules. You can listen to the episode on kind of what those rules are. Yeah. But they basically petitioned the IAU to change the name officially to Zuzve. Yes. And it was accepted. February 5th, the IAU accepted it. And the working group for the small body center, I think is what the group was. They said, yeah, okay, that's its name. And now it's officially <laughs> designated 524522 Zeus Fay, because it's still got to have a number, still got to have a catalog number. Right. <laughs> right. 
um yeah and it's weird because if you look at uh, a list of a lot of like asteroids and stuff like they name them you know there, there's all sorts of like crazy names out there there actually mm -hmm. is in the episode they talked about how there is an asteroid named spock but it's actually named after the astronomer's cat whose name was spock i love uh, that which i thought was kind of cool so there there is a spock uh but it's not um not what you have think anything to do with star trek <laughs> It's very, I wrote my whole physics thesis, but I used the word we instead of I. And so I just co-authored with my cat. Like there's a person who did that. <laughs> awesome. Well, if you're out there and you have found any of this uh, fascinating, we've got a few more uh, minutes to join in on the conversation, ask some questions uh, about any of this. Um, I, I see you, uh, you've got one more picture to, to share with us, Molly, before we wrap up. I do. So this is kind of the the end of ingenuity, right? So this was taken by Perseverance, the rover Perseverance. If you remember, I think it was last episode or the episode before, it's been a whirlwind. Um, ingenuity, of course, was damaged. And the only way it talks to us is through Perseverance. And now, you know, Perseverance's mission keeps on keeping on. And so it's on its way leaving. Um, and eventually we will not be able to communicate with ingenuity anymore. So this is kind of a last look back at the at the helicopter as perseverance continues on but what i wanted to highlight is the terrain right yeah. if you remember from that episode i was talking about how they think the damage like it had to emergency land because it couldn't tell where it was anymore like the hazards were off and it's you look at all these rocks over here this is all probably not the best place to land all the rocks in the foreground also not the best place to land you'd think but then these dunes and just what looks like a very safe space to land was actually not because I guess from the air that would all look like nothing, right? There's no identifying things in there from the air. Whereas on the bouldery rocky parts, there's like clear things you can pick out to orient yourself. But this really does just look like ocean waves, right? There's not much it, it could have done. So this was just, yeah, the last update of my, probably my favorite tech demo ever. Honestly, I love this helicopter. So Good work to the Ingenuity team, for sure, for sure. And, you know, I can't wait to see another one of those things on Mars. That would be pretty cool, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is a great picture. And if uh, if you're just learning about Ingenuity, the Mars helicopter, you can go back and listen to or watch the previous uh, Ask an Astronomer episode from a couple of weeks ago, as well as all of the Ask an Astronomer episodes uh, for the past three years. They're all up there. Lots of great stuff uh, to delve into. Marley, thank you so much. This was a really fun episode. I feel like we need uh, some of these episodes every once in a while, especially after the sad one uh, of the end of Ingenuity uh, last yeah. episode, right? No, so. it is. It was good. It's it's always fun when something funny happened. It has a good ending. You know, it got it. It's got its name. Now that now that the poster is correct, it is called Zuzve. You know, like it's accurate. So <laughs> that's, right. that's fun. Yeah. Uh, full circle. Well, full thank circle. you so much. This, uh, this is a great episode. Thank you uh, for everyone watching on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you want to join live for a Another episode of Ask Astronomer. We will be live in two weeks. That is going to be on do, 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 February the 22nd. Uh, we've got a big uh, Valentine's uh, event next week, which uh, tickets are selling fast. So, so if you're out there, uh, it is a 19 plus event, um, which you know can be a pro um, if you are 19 plus, but if you're under <laughs> 19, unfortunately. But we have a family event, though. Uh, yes, which uh, is free, but you need to get in here. It's going to be very busy um, on family day, February 19th. So we have a balance. We've got the family event and we've got the 19 plus event, uh, but we've got a listening room. We've got a full music playlist with visuals uh, for that Valentine's event. Plus Marley and a, a journalist from Northwest territories are going to be talking about the Aurora. So really cool stuff we got coming up. Uh, that's it for this episode of Ask an Astronomer. We will see you all in two weeks. Take care, everyone.